Hebrews. Let's turn this mic on. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and uh, strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunities to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them, for them. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God has planned everything better for us, so that only together with us will they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race and mark out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <coughs> Sinner him who endured such op opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So be it. Am I on? Okay. Start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that we can come here and freely worship you. We thank you that we can communicate to you in prayer, that we have been sealed by your Spirit, that we also have Christ interceding for us, that we are your own. Lord, help us to take full advantage of the Spirit that is inside of us, to realize that we are a royal priesthood gathered together to proclaim the gospel message. Lord, that each and every day that we're still alive, whether it be the year 2019 or whatever it is, that, that the reason that you haven't returned is because everyone that needs to be drawn to you have not been yet. Lord, let us to live out a life of urgency and worth, a life that is changed so that we can bring glory and honor to you and show the world the love that you have for them through Jesus Christ living in us. We thank you and praise you in your Son's name. Amen. So do you want to be different? Do you want to be changed? You are. You're a new creation in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But sometimes we do need to be reminded of that and we need to grab a hold of what God has given us. He didn't give us the Holy Spirit just to save us. If that would have been the case, as soon as we got saved, He would call us home. But instead, we have a mission field. The same mission field that Jesus Christ had. The mission field that He gave up heaven to come to earth so that He could die to save us from our sins. And we are His hands and feet. We are the body of Christ. We are a light that cannot be hidden. So God gives us His Spirit to seal us and to equip us for every good work. But do you want a fire set in your soul? Something that you can't contain and can't control. Is that really what you want? The world may persecute you. Look at the Old Testament prophets. That's exactly what Jesus and John the Baptist said. They said you persecute those. Those that are messengers from the Lord. If you also look in Scripture, every time that the Holy Spirit is given to an individual in Scripture, you'll see them proclaiming the love of God. His message to the world. They can't Stay silent. Because if you have the Spirit of God living in you, if you've been sealed, then you are a new creation. 
The old has gone. There's no reason whatsoever to be living with the things that you lived with before you got saved. The pain, the suffering, the lack of joy, the, the troubled things in your heart, whatever they are, you, Jesus died so that you could have joy, that you could have peace, that you could have life. Not so that you could attempt to do it, but that you could have them. They are yours. That's why He died on the cross. So that you could live forever in God's presence and live as a child of God. Sure, we fall short every day. That's why we gather together. So that we can be with each other and comfort each other and lift each other up and come together and study God's Word. So that we can grow to be more like Christ. Last week I mentioned the parable of the sower. God came to sow His seed so that there would be a harvest. And there can't be a harvest unless you let Him cultivate and make that good soil. The other soils don't matter. There can't be a harvest unless there's growth. And the way that you're going to receive growth is to get on your knees and humble yourself before God, to seek His face, turn from your wicked ways, pray, envelop the, the power of the Spirit that lives inside of you. Not try to keep living by your own power on your own might, because that got you nowhere, but to live by the power of the Spirit so that you will be different, you will be changed. Last week I preached about the fact that Jesus will return the second advent of Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed and Holy One. The one who came to save, and the way that He came to save was to lay down His life. A foolish story to those who don't believe, but the message of foolishness of the cross is salvation to those who believe. Power to live a changed life. Power to overcome all of these things that bring us down so that we will have victory in Jesus. We sing these words over and over but think about them. Like Kim said, contemplate on them. All the words that she said are great words for you to sit and co contemplate, to really chew on and soak up. So are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Are you coming to living water to drink so that you will thirst no more? Or are you playing at church, religion? <laughs> Look back through, all through time and we'll see people that play at religion and where that got them. Nowhere. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. And He said, I am the bread of life. How are you going to get nourishment unless you feed upon it? He said, I am living water so that springs of living water would rise up in you. But how are you going to be a spring to someone else? And how are you going to get the nourishment that you need unless you drink that living water? We can call ourselves Christians all day long, but to be like Christ means to do the things that Christ did. And I can't do them, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And He said, I have not orphaned you or left you alone. I have given you the Spirit. Wow! What a great and marvelous God we serve. What a great plan that's so simple but yet so hard to do because it requires one thing. It requires for me to get off the throne and give it to Him. It requires not a Savior, but a Lord. Because if you're trying to grasp onto just a Savior without a Lord, you don't have a Savior. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? He's pretty clear in His teachings. And He will return. And we teach love and everything, and that's wonderful, and that's what, so much what the church teaches today. But we also have to remember that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We can't forget the Old Testament in lieu of the New Testament. It's all the same God. The God who patiently longs suffering for His people, even though that they are wicked through and through and detestable all the time. So it was His will to crush His Son instead so that we could live. Because we can never, ever get to God so He came to us. Wow. Why would we not worship that God? That same God has to judge sin though, and I'm so glad that He does have to judge sin because I know that heaven will be a perfect place as a result. 
I know that when Jesus does return, it will be with his angels. Not a little cute little cubbly thing with a little bow and arrow like Cupid, but something that we read throughout Scripture that makes men tremble and fear faint as dead. So the first thing they usually said is, don't be afraid because people are trembling at their presence. And they've come at that time <laughs> friendly. When they return, they're going to come with the fire and the power of God's wrath against those who do not love Him through Jesus Christ. Don't mistake that. But to those that do know Jesus Christ, those who have obeyed His commandments, those who take up His call and live like Him, they have no fear because perfect love casts out all fear. I remember fearing my dad when I was little, but I knew there was love there. And the more that I understood my dad's love for me, the more I did fear him. The more I did fear him a little bit when I did wrong because I knew there was punishment. But as I grew to understand more, the more I knew that that punishment was for my own good and because I had done wrong. And how much more will a heavenly father be a perfect father for us? Last week, we read a scripture that said that we must walk as Jesus walked. And the only way to do that is by the power of the Spirit. So if Jesus returned today to claim His church, how would this church fare? I didn't say how would the church as a whole fare. I asked how this church would fare. Because you are all right here active and serving in this church. Uh, at least I hope so. Oh, that reminds me. If I don't have talent surveys, I'm going to come looking for you. And I, meant, I changed them intentionally to spiritual gifts and commitments so that you would realize that you have a spiritual gift given to you by God to serve in the body of Christ. If this is the church you're coming to, whether you're a member or not, if you're coming regularly, you're a part of this body and there is a place for you to serve. If you're wondering about that, then let's sit down and talk. But don't avoid doing it or you're avoiding God, not me. Decide where the Spirit is leading you and be obedient and serve. Because just like Paul says, and we're going to read the Scripture here in a minute, as parts of the human body, we need each one to function correctly. Or if we don't, we're in a world of hurt, aren't we? You take one little thing, you take one little pinched nerve in your body and see how it affects you. And we are all are the body of Christ, given gifts to serve one another and to proclaim the gospel message to the world. And Jesus loved the church so much, you so much, that He gave His life. Oh, to give His life, He had to humble Himself and come down to the very thing that He created. We're going to do communion at the end of service. And if you listen to the lyrics of the, some of the songs there, Jacob and I were talking about it. It talks about when the rocks cry out in silence. And he said, but Scripture says that if we're quiet, the rocks will cry out. And I said, yeah, if we're quiet, quiet. But ever go up to a mountaintop and look at the rocks, look at the glory of God? They cry out in silence that there's an awesome God who loves us. And praise be to God, they haven't had to cry out yet because there's always been a remnant of God's people who've cried out. Oh, if they started crying out, we're kind of going to lose hope, right? So they cry out in silence, claiming the glory of a mighty, awesome God who created all these things for us to enjoy, but for us to see Him in creation and give Him the worship that He deserves and honors. And on top of that, He sent His Son to, to die for us, to do what we never ever could do. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. So is it just okay to be saved? To be saved and I know it and my life not surely show it? Is that saved? James is pretty clear there. Peter's clear there. John's clear there. We've got to be like Jesus Yes, that means that we grow. Paul said that he was sorry that he had to only give them milk because they weren't ready for anything. They weren't ready for real meat. Well, I don't know about you, but in 2019, I want to eat more meat and more meat and more meat. And I hope and pray that you walk with me. And thank you for saying that, Kim, because it goes right along with my message. 
we've got to realize that we need to grow. So there will be a harvest. You realize when we do our job and we're the hands and feet of Christ and the last person to be saved is saved, whenever that is, we don't know the time or the hour, but we've been given the Spirit of God and we will be His witnesses. Once we've witnessed to that last person, we go home to glory forever and ever and ever. Wow, so why wouldn't you be witnessing to your grandchildren, your children, your brothers and sisters, your friends and neighbors, and even your enemies, so that Jesus Christ will return just as God has promised, and we will spend eternity with Him. Why would you not do that? Oh, because I can't do it. Well, you're right, you can't again. I can't preach, but I'm up here. I told you before, when that first happened, I was like, really? And then all these stories of all these Old Testament saints and stuff kept coming back to me. <laughs> they did it. They did it. David was even called a man after God's own heart. And look at the things that he did. But when he sinned, because we all sinned and fall short of God's glory, when he sinned, he got back down on his knees. Or he laid out flat. And he said... God, forgive me. You and only you I have sinned against. Even though it affects a ton of other people, the sin is against God because He's the only one that can judge. I'm reading in Job right now, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And I'm reading it, and I'm thinking again and again because I've read it, you know, wow, this is a cosmic spiritual battle here. I don't understand, but I don't need to understand it. I need to know that God is sovereign. That God is in complete power, complete control. That no one can lay a claim against Him. Job says, even if I am innocent and I proclaim that, my own mouth declares that I'm not because I'm not God. I am nothing but a mere mortal. If I could, which I can't because I am guilty, but if I could live a life without sin... I would still be a mere mortal that only is alive because of God's grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. That we have oxygen to breathe. That we can get up each morning, even if there is a pain and a suffering we have to deal with. And another tragedy that comes up today. By God's grace, we're alive, and by God's grace, Jesus died, and we will go to glory and spend it with God where we won't have any of that pain and suffering. What a mighty God we serve. Not just say that we believe in, but serve. Here's a thought. This is from people who thought that they really did believe in Jesus. Not the Pharisees, not other people. Luke 6, 46, this is Jesus' words. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Not just one time, but two times, Lord, Lord. Making His emphasis there. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, Master, Master, King, King? Whatever word you want to put in there that's similar to that. And not do what I say. And then take on some studying of the Old Testament and see what Lord really means. Your mind can't comprehend what God's Lordship is over you. But through the Spirit, you can become more like Christ each and every day. We can't comprehend how magnificent God is. But if we get just a little glimpse of that, we can see how inferior we are but yet how precious we are and beloved that He would send His only Son to die for us. What an awesome God that demands our obedience, our worship, our praise. But yet He gives us a choice, doesn't He? What more fair God could there ever be? What more just God could there ever be? Because He lets us have a choice. He doesn't force men to come to Him. All of the rest of creation, the waves roar God's majesty. They can't do anything but do that. Every time you see them lapping on the beach and hear that sounding, close your eyes and hear it. 
They're proclaiming God's majesty. But you and I have a choice. We have to decide if we're going to get off the throne and give Him the throne and serve Him and love Him with all of our heart, mind, body, and soul. <laughs> and then when we do, oh, we'll love one another, won't we? In 1 Corinthians, we're getting to chapter 13, that love chapter. Because in my opinion, reading, reading 1 Corinthians, there's a problem with the division in that church. Oh, we don't want division in this church. No way. But there's division all over it there when people aren't united in the Spirit. There's division in that church and Paul gets up to all this. All these gifts that you have and everything. Let me show you a most excellent way. Love. Love. Because that's exactly why we're here today. God loved us. That's exactly why we're, we will be redeemed if we believe in Jesus Christ. Because God loves us. And we're to love one another as Christ loved and gave Himself for the church. Last week I read this and I want to read it again just to remind us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6. By this we can be sure, confident, that we ha have come to know Him, to have intimacy with Him, if we keep His commands. If anyone, not someone, but anyone, says, I know Him, but does not keep His commands, He is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But, complete opposite of that person who's deceived, if anyone keeps His word, the love of God has been truly perfected in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. Whoever claims to abide in Him must walk as Jesus walked. You know, once upon a time, and if you Google it now, you won't even get this anymore. You'll get the movie. There was the greatest ship ever known. It was called Unsinkable. It was called the what? The Titanic. You know the thing that cost most people their lives? It wasn't the lack of lifeboats because the lifeboats were half empty. It was because people believed that ship was unsinkable. They had been told that for so long. So they stayed on the boat. They did whatever it was. You know what time they realized that it was sinkable? When it sunk. And there have been many people throughout the history of the human race who have put their faith in something other than Jesus Christ. And what do you think happened to them? I don't know about you, but I want to fix my eyes, as Merle said, on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of my faith. Our faith. I don't want to be set aside and waver. I don't want Satan to have one foothold. I want to be confident in the hope that I have. And I need each and every of you to help walk through it because I'm just another sinner saved by grace. My wife called me a hypocrite yesterday, and those words were well deserved. Because <laughs> I am. But when I heard that, it pierced my heart and I asked her for forgiveness and I asked God for forgiveness because I sinned against Him. God loves us so much that He sent His only Son to die for us that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Thessalonica was a seaport town Prosperous, They could have put their faith in building ships. But there was a church there that put their faith in Jesus Christ. And here's what Paul writes in his second letter to them because there are people out there telling them, you don't have to worry about all these things. And by the time of the second letter, people were telling them, hey, religious people, you've missed the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Paul writes this letter to them and says, no, you haven't. You've not missed His coming. Don't let them fool you. You focus on what Jesus taught and you continue to be His hands and feet until He returns. Period. And here's what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. Do you see a pattern here compared to must walk like Christ? We have to start with milk, yes, but then we go on to solid food and we need each other to help do that. One organ helps another organ with a 
one foot, we need a second foot to help us walk, don't we? It's kind of hard without it. God has put the pieces of the body together just as He pleased. And Paul wasn't talking about the human body. He was using that so we could visualize like a parable the spiritual body that we are. Because your faith is growing more and more and the love you have for one another is increasing. Oh, your faith is growing more and more because you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. So that the second commandment, love one another, is also there. There's, there's the great commandment sitting there. And this is how Paul knew that they, they were following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. That they were indeed Christians so that they could be confident they hadn't missed the second coming. They could have full assurance that they would be taken to glory. Verse 4, Therefore among God's churches we boast about your perseverance in faith and all the persecutions and trials you're enduring. Nothing new there. We're going to face trials and tr troubles. Jesus says, if I had to suffer, why in the world would you not think you're going to not have to suffer? All of this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy. Worthy of what? The kingdom of God for which you are suffering. If you think life's an easy chair when you're a Christian then you're listening to the wrong gospel again. Jesus Christ has called you to give up your life. He says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow after me. He goes on to say that if you want to be his disciple and choose to be your disciple, and you put a hand on the plow, meaning that you're going to work for the harvest. He says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. If you put your hand to that plow, but look back longingly at the world, then you're not worthy of the kingdom. Because what we suffer for here doesn't compare to what we'll receive when we're counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're suffering. Verse 6, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to, those, to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when? Hadn't happened yet. Couldn't have. Because this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven and it will be in blazing fire with His powerful angels. Has that happened yet? Nope. Sorry. But Jesus will come that way and those who do not know Him will have eternal dread. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be separation of goats and sheep. See, goats think they're sheep. But sheep follow Jesus' voice, don't they? They go through the gate, which is Jesus. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 8, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Now you can look at that verse two ways. You can look at it as those are two separate entities or they're the same entity. I think if you read Paul's letters, if you read this letter, I think you'll side with mine. This is my interpretation. <laughs> it might not be another commentator that these are two different people. You have those who do not know. They don't have a relationship with God. And you have those who do not obey. Oh, wait a minute now. That puts a difference in sheep and goat, don't it? doesn't it? Because you can say you're sheep all day long, but you have to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I read you the verse from last week. It says you must walk as Jesus walked. So if you're proclaiming you have salvation through Jesus Christ and you're not obeying Him, then you might not realize just like the people on the Titanic did that they weren't safe till that boat sank. Now the reason I'm telling you that is because it is on my shoulders. I don't want any one of you to perish. Maybe you're saying, oh, I've heard this over and over again. All I want you to do is listen to Scripture, not me. And that person is also the same person. Because the person who does not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is one who doesn't know Him. So you can look at it either way. The reason I, I like to separate it, if I'm not 
obeying Jesus' commands, if there's not a desire in my heart for the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me to set me afire, then maybe the Holy Spirit is really not inside of me. And I can give you scripture after scripture after scripture for that as well. Do not let anything deceive you. Jesus Christ, Lord of all lords, King of all kings, gave up heaven to die for you so that you might live. Verse 9, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. On the day He comes to be glorified in His holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony. And as he says in the beginning, your faith is growing more and more. The love you have for one another is increasing. So they can have that confidence. This includes you because you believed our testimony. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of His calling. Growth continuing to be and more and more like Christ, to die to myself, to be more empowered by the Spirit, and that by His power He may bring you to fruition. That's kind of a weird word, so let me put it to ripen you, mature, mature you, to fulfill what He has planned for you, the good works that He has planned long ago for you at this present day, in this present time, in this present church, in this present community. God knew it all and placed you here to do His work. And that by His power He may bring you to fruition your every desire for goodness and every deed prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace our God and Lord the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. So are you growing more and more in your faith? Are you loving one another, even your enemies? I'm looking at Merle because we talk about that, not because he doesn't. Because that's a hard concept. But as we die more and more, we see that Christ did just that. And the more and more that we grow, the more and more we pray, the more and more we or spend time with each other, the more we see Christ's love and it compels us to love even our enemies. We're studying 1 Corinthians, and I'm just going to briefly read through this, but it, what we're studying here goes so perfectly along with that. And I'll be honest, there's only a few of us studying. I wish every one of us were studying it. I wish every time we came together, everyone was here. But that's not the case. And I'm not saying it to... to make you feel bad or anything else. I just want you to hunger and thirst for God's Word, for time with one another. And then that's my prayer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, Now about gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now don't dwell there on the curse because I don't curse God, but do you call Jesus Lord? Or do you call Him Savior more? Do you call Him Lord of your life? Because the only way you can call Him Lord is by the power of the Holy Spirit that you've been born again. Verse 4, there are different kind of gifts, but the same Spirit that distributes them. There are different kind of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and every one the same God. Did you see the Trinity there? Spirit, Lord being Jesus, and God the Father. Now to each one of you, each and every one, the manifestation, the proof or the revealing, the genuineness, whatever word you want to use there, the Spirit, is for the common good. The common good of the body first so that we can be a body out in the world. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by, the same, by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between Spirits. To another speaking in different tongues. And to still another interpretation of tongues. Now there's several gifts here there, but that's just a sampling of the gifts, which means a giver gives them to you. Okay? And this giver, God, gave them to you to use, to give away. Not to keep, but to give to others, to draw them to Him. 
But if you notice, not concentrating on the different gifts, you can do like Kim said, those are the words you can concentrate on later. Concentrating on the same Spirit, the one Spirit, still another, the, the same Spirit, although they're different gifts. Because you are God's child, you have been sealed by the Spirit, and each and every one of you is given a gift from the Spirit you might not ever knew you had to use to build up the body of Christ, to serve your God, to worship Him and give Him the praise that He deserved, deserves. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He, God Himself, distributes to each one just as He determines. Paul goes on to write about the necessity of a body having its certain parts because they serve the body. And my body works a lot more effectively when those parts work the way that they're supposed to. I challenge you to read on. I'm not going to read on because I could spend all day up here, but you guys probably would not appreciate it as much as I think I need to speak. But Paul's emphasis here is that each and every one of you have a part. And if you realize and accept Jesus Christ and see the love of God for you, you will play out that part in the body. Why would He give you the gift for you to not use it? And the reason I say that starting in 2019 is so that we get on the same focus as a church. That we have unity rather than division. So there's not like there are in some churches, right, Bonnie? Where they have growth coming in and there's arguing over a nursery and it's dividing the church. Mm. What in the world? What if they just got together and sat down and prayed together and realized there's one God, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and one Spirit who distributes to this body according to the way God sees for you to use the gift that has been given to you to serve Him, to give Him the worship and honor He deserves because He gave up heaven to die for you. That's how Paul starts out the letter to Corinthians. He could have stopped right there if they would have realized it, but instead he has to continue on and there's a second letter to Corinthians and there's more than that. We only have two though. And we don't know what happened to the Corinthians church, but there's not a sign of it in history after so they might not have ever got their divisions taken care of. I don't know. All I know is what God has intended and why He's given us the Spirit to glorify Him and to be united with one another, to be one body with one head and master, Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered why we don't see as many miracles today? Why you don't experience healing as much? These are the gifts that were listed here. Why you don't hear tongues as much? Oh, you might in certain churches on the gift you're on, but I'm talking about in general. Is it because the body isn't functioning the way Jesus intended, what He died for? Could that be it? Jesus Himself said in Matthew 13, 58, He said, did, and Jesus Himself did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. I heard something on tongues the other day and it'll stick with me because it just one of those things that pierced me. I said, how could you ever think that the Spirit, because I've said that before in the Scripture here, would give you the gift of tongues if you're not boldly proclaiming the gospel message in your native tongue? How can you ever think that you would experience healing in your life or in someone else's life if you don't have faith? Jesus would have performed many miracles there instead of some, a few, if they would have had faith. And He hasn't gone anywhere. He's still here. He lives inside of each and every one of us. And the reason that we don't see the miracles that we could be seeing is because of our lack of faith and obedience. Hmm. In Mark... Chapter 6, verse 5 says the same story. It says, Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay His hands on a few sick people and heal them. 
I take that to mean that there were many there who needed healing. They were sick and hurting. But he couldn't. Didn't say he wouldn't. Said he couldn't do it. Why? Because of their lack of faith. Verse 6 says he was amazed at their lack of faith. God Himself giving up heaven to come and die for us, to be humiliated, persecuted, and put on a cross. And you don't think He can bring healing? You don't put your trust, your total faith in Him? He could not because, see, God acts and works through a praying, humble, obedient people. Start reading if you don't think so. The Old Testament is one pattern after another, and a faithful God. It's a new year. Time to make resolutions and improvements, right? So I'm going to ask you a few questions. How is your faith? I didn't ask you how your neighbor's was, your husband's was, your children's were. I asked how yours is. Do you profess Jesus as your Savior? Now the numbers might go down a little bit. Is He your Lord? Lord and Master of all. Not some. All. Not most. All. Well, today's a new year. Guess what? Tomorrow's a new day. Guess what? Any day that you have breath, you can turn to Him. You can repent, turn from your evil ways, bow down your face and pray to Him and God will heal you. In fact, the Scripture says He'll heal your land. Because where two or three are gathered together, there I am. I challenge you at Christmas to give gifts to Jesus that we put under the tree. And let me say this first, because <laughs> I'm going to probably offend some people today. Oh well. I took those gifts home and I prayed over them. I didn't share them with anyone else, not even my wife. But I prayed over them also. This is a loving church. It's a giving church. And like you said, Catherine, it's a faithful church that goes to the worship services and everything. But that doesn't mean that we can't improve. I was also heartbroken that there were only five pieces of paper in that. Only five people put gifts to Jesus at Christmas time. I put those stickies in three straight weeks. I didn't say it the third week. I think I said it the second week. I'm not condemning you. We get caught up. We get busy. Blah, blah, blah. But Scripture's clear again. Don't let Satan get one foothold. Don't get distracted. The Scripture we read is we have a race to run. And Paul tells us to throw off anything that hinders us. If God would give up heaven, you can give up some of the things that make your life easy and comfortable. They might be the things that are hindering you. So I've prayed to those prayed those and everything. I'm going to make another challenge. If you look in your bulletin, there's a reading schedule. I don't know where my bulletin is. I'm going to sit down and read this reading schedule again. To read the Bible through, it's in a chronological order. That's why it skips from Genesis to Job. So you can read the first chapters of Genesis, then go on to Job and get that story in there and everything. It takes less than 15 minutes a day depending on how much you read. If you're like me, I get distracted by God's Word. That's okay to get distracted by that. And I wind up spending hours in it. But if you just want to read it, okay? And that's okay, because that will get you started on hungering and thirsting for more, because you're eating the bread and drinking the living water. But if you want to do that, it takes you 11 minutes and something a day at normal speech to read it through in a year. Guess what though? You've got to play catch up because it's already day six. And I didn't start till Friday. And I'm on day six now. It was easy to do yesterday to get caught up. Now, I'm not telling you to procrastinate like I did. Okay? I'm telling you that I would love for you to walk through this with me. So I'm challenging you again for another commitment. Maybe there'll be more than five that take me up on that. If you want to, also, I have ordered some journals that I'll have next week. Amazon Prime delivery wasn't prime enough. <laughs> so I'll have them next week. 
and you can take your thoughts, what God spoke to you and journalize, and you can also put down a prayer as a result. And when you start praying more and more like that, the more you'll realize that my prayer life's not all about me. As I pray more and more, I start praying for my family and friends. As I start praying more and more, I pray about even my enemies. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He prayed for us. Read John chapter 17 see what He prayed about. He was leaving this earth and He prayed for His disciples. He prayed for us. He prayed for all future believers and promised the Holy Spirit. So next week I'll have journals if you want to do that and then you've got to catch up on them as well. But we're at day six. You've got through next week there. And then I'll give you a complete schedule and everything. If you want to take that challenge with me, I would love for you to take it with me because I will need someone also, another part of the body of Christ, to come to me and say, hey, are you keeping up like you said you would? Because I'm a sinner saved by grace. <laughs> I will fall short of my expectations. But I hope to be like David. I hope to humble myself and tell him that I've sinned against him and I need restoration. And guess what? He'll lift me up because he's faithful to do that. Are we growing more and more in our faith? Is the love that we have for one another increasing more and more? Revelation is the last book in the Bible written about the things that must come. And we study it so many times we get caught up on what does all these things mean? And I don't think that was ever the intent of the letter. The letter is say, his intent was to tell John, the last disciple, my opinion again, you don't have to have the same opinion, not to lose hope. These things have to come first. Just like Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And if you'll notice, right after he says the purpose of the letter and everything, he goes and gives the letters to the different physical churches that are there in that day. Only two of them get a good letter. The rest get letters that are good, but bad. Good that God is faithful. Bad that you're not following Him faithfully. And in each and every one, there's a promise. If you repent and turn to Jesus, problem solved. Buy salve from Jesus to cure your spiritual blindness. Don't sit in your confidence because you're still poor, wretched, pitiful, naked, and blind. And it's been refreshing to read Job to see that he didn't do anything wrong, but he realized he's still simply a mere mortal that deserves nothing except that it's given to him by God's grace. Let 2019 be a time when you worship God, where we grow with one another to be more and more like Christ. We do make a difference in this world just as Jesus died and intended for us. So I've got communion elements here also. And I'm going to pray over them. And you're welcome to come take communion however you want or not to. I'll remind you again that Paul gives instructions for communion and he says not to do this in an unworthy manner. The night Jesus died, he said, take this bread. That's if you choose to take it. Take this and do this in remembrance of me. Why I came, what I taught, the commission, the great commission that I gave to you. The reason that the Spirit was given, so that you don't need to know all the answers to everything, but instead you will be my witnesses because the power that is inside of you to live out a royal priesthood life. Reading through the Old Testament, you'll understand again that God came to the temple and the priest delivered God's Word. That's you and I now in this world. The veil was torn. God dwells inside of His children as pre we are priests to tell others of Jesus Christ. He said, this is my body, stripped and beaten for you, naked on a cross, humiliated, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. If that wasn't clear, they put that on the, the name plaque. 
even in pe people's mocking, <laughs> the facts that God is sovereign, that Jesus is Lord, is still there. And the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me because it is my blood poured out for you. This new covenant, God keeps His covenants, this eternal covenant, that because of Jesus' blood, that all you have to do is believe by faith. Put your trust in Him. By grace are you saved through faith. Nothing that you've done, nothing that you could ever do. You are a mere mortal. God is sovereign, mighty, and no one can challenge Him. And you stand accused only to Him. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, you've been justified and set free, washed white as snow, if you believe in Him. So, come, take communion. The altar's here if you want it. When we're done, Debbie's going to close us in a song and a verse. There's little cups, there's big cups, there's bread. I'm going to pray over the communion and you come if you feel led. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for all that you've done, for all that you're going to do. We thank you for this body. I thank you for these brothers and sisters that I can call my brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. I hope that we can be iron that sharpens iron. I hope that and pray by the power of your Spirit that we become a mighty church or that we make a difference in Bonner's Ferry. I hope that, that w the things that we do encourage others. I'm so encouraged that more and people are coming to the, the community worship. Lord, I just thank You for this church, and I pray, Lord, that we will grow more and more and more, that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we eat more solid food, and that we drink the spiritual water that Jesus Christ gives us so that springs of living water come out of us. <laughs> Hence our name, Springs of Living Water, Free Methodist Church. Father, we thank You. We also pray for other churches that are struggling in everything, Father. We pray for those that aren't able to be here today. And Lord, we just give You all glory and honor. We thank You that it was finished and complete on the cross and that Jesus Christ said, don't hold anything against us. We thank You that we know that His covenant, that His blood was satisfying to You. And that it was your will to crush him so that we would not be crushed, but instead have everlasting life. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.